morning. Good morning. I suppose I have to keep my phone off so you can keep your phones off on too. Uh, I'm going to control it. Okay, I'll do it quickly. I'll try to keep it on time. Um, so my name is Peter Bilak. I have a design studio in The Hague and I've been working there for <coughs> over 10 years. And graphic design, I suppose many people here are designers and graphic designers. It's a great discipline. Uh, you get to be exposed to many different things. Uh, and, but there's also a frustrating element in it, it, and that's because it's very responsive. You wait for the clients to ask you a question, and then you can really do something. Um, and I always didn't know what to do, how to do, deal with this. You know, I could have, on one hand, I always wished to do some projects, and no one asked me to do them. Do you keep waiting for the phone call to ask you to do, I don't know, uh, some special things you read, an exhibition or a book or a magazine? Uh, this is the work we've done in the past you know, few years, uh, and the work has changed quite a lot uh, I think in this decade. Uh, at the beginning, it was all commissioned work, and slowly... Okay. <laughs> is this better? Okay. Good. Well, in short, the work has changed in the last 10 years that it's no longer waiting for clients to ask us to do projects, but become a lot more pro proactive, and working, creating basically our own projects first, and then doing something with them basically becoming a publisher. And I don't mean only the magazine, but we publish small books, we, we make exhibitions, we publish these typefaces, fonts, we publish software. So creating a lot of work without really being asked, and then that work becomes, you know, it's, I think it's still design, but it's kind of a different notion of design because it works without the, the commissioner, without the client. Although it's still dependent on the client, I mean, they, they come later. Um, and one of the dreams I always had like, was, you know, I'm really interested in text, uh, and I'm interested in text, you know, I, I, you can see these typefaces, you know, the formal attribute of text, but I'm interested in reading, because reading is something that, it's one of the best ways to acquire new, new knowledge. Uh, it's really, you can learn so many things by reading. And this is a picture of my home library. Uh, and if I look at the, the books I read, or the things I read, it's probably, you know, newspapers and a few magazines, I think the Yellow Sink is National Geographic, which is my favorite one, and a lot of uh, fiction and, and literature. Uh, there's a very few design magazines, although you know, I work in the field of design, uh, I realize that these design magazines, they're very hermetical, they're very made by designers, for designers, uh, written by designers, it's a really small world, and it's quite easy to get into it, but it doesn't really expose, doesn't go, doesn't extend to, to a larger world. And I hoped, you know, like, it, would there be possibility to create a magazine that would still deliver relevant things for designers, but would be willing to, you know, to recognize design as something much wider. You know, when we talk about design, we tend to think that design is, you know, shoes and chairs. But we forget that everything is designed. If you realize it or not, all human-made objects are designed. Uh, and it doesn't really matter if they come from Italy or if they come from Malaysia, they're still designed. It doesn't matter if they're expensive or cheap, they're all designed. Uh, and often in the conditions which are, you know, where people don't have too many resources, people tend to be a lot more creative. So I was hoping to, you know, come up with something that would expand this vision of design and look at creativity in unexpected places. And to cut it, to make it short, uh, we, uh, exactly a year ago, well, October last year, uh, we came up with the uh, uh, crowdfunding site, and uh, uh, you know, the day before launching, it had zero visitors. It was really like starting from scratch. It did not use any Kickstarter, and I can explain why, because, well, for many reasons, uh, why existing sites, but really started, the project one, project zero, would be to creating a website that allows financing a magazine, and really look at models of you know, how magazine will operate. Um, the website will explain what this is about. It would explain you know, an ambition to, uh, to present design in a wider perspective. It would, uh, and at the end, you know, the crowdfunding sites are not only to bring funds. Uh, I thought that's very important, but it's really about creating community. And that was the main reason why we started doing our own one. Uh, because you're not doing magazine for yourself. Even if you have all the money, it does not really matter. You need to have the readers. And you know, to have a community around it, the readership, is really critical. And I'll be talking a lot about you know, the behind things, behind scenes of the magazine. If you look at a, uh, a typical newsstand uh, anywhere, uh, 
you know what these things magazines have in common? I mean, they are all diverse and different themes. But really, the business model is really almost identical behind all of them. 99% of them, they are funded by advertising only. And uh, the ratio of ad advertising and editorial content would be about half half. Some magazines, mainly American ones, would have like more 60% of ad adverts. And uh, no, the European one would have a little bit more uh, content. But it would be about half half what, you, uh, what is you know, content and what is really advertising. Uh, but the revenue out of it, it they're all funded <coughs> by advertising. Almost 100% of the revenue of all these magazines come from advertising, not from sales. So if you as a reader come up and buy a magazine, you don't really contribute financially to, to running of the magazine. Uh, because the magazine is not really made for the readers, they're made by advertisers. And I think that's the trouble. You know, the, you, you know, basically the reader becomes a product of a magazine. And depending on how many readers do you have, they can sell the, to the the magazine to the advertisers for higher price. And that's a troubling thing uh, for many reasons. Uh, first, that of course you get less content and more adverts. But secondly, mainly because you don't really know the motivations, what is put inside. If it's really made by advertisers, that means that the content is not really made for you as a reader. It's made to appeal to someone else. I'll talk a few example. Um, at the time when we launched, exactly the same day, uh, Newsweek uh, announced it was closing the print edition. And this article came out and said that uh, Newsweek, after 79 years in print, they're closing down the print edition um, and will exist only online, but now the online edition is also phasing out. So this was the last issue of Newsweek. At the time when it closed down, it had one and a half million paying subscribers. So these people did not pay for the magazine, they paid for shipping. They, you know, someone else paid for the magazine, it was the advertisers. And they decided to, you know, because they had a drop in advertising, not in readership, they had to close. So the reason, you know, their role in the magazine was a really minimal one. You know, when making a magazine, I really thought like, you know, why not make a magazine for the readers, not really for that, for, for the advertisers. Look, look at different models of making magazines. And that's why I'll be talking about, uh, of course, content, uh, but mainly about, you know, the behind scenes, you know, it's about financing of magazines. And also, um, I learned a few things about the it's not just the content or the money, but it's really about how, how to get it to people, about distribution, and a few things about production and design. Uh, I think the common question that my friends asked me was like, well, why are you making, you know, you saw the print edition, why are you making a print magazine? Um, and I didn't really have an answer. I mean, I, I like reading on paper. Uh, it's really, I think many people do, because especially if they have long form reading. <coughs> And this magazine that we're talking about, it favors you know, uh, longer form continuous reading. Uh, it's a, but the best thing about you know, running this crowdfunding campaign is that you can ask the question yourself. I can ask people how they want to read the magazine. And when we, when we ask them you know, if you want to read in print and be more expensive or cheaper and digital, people responded and they voted with their wallets. Uh, and I was really astonished that, you know, that, that people you know, chose for having print edition, which is fantastic. Uh, because, again, some of the things work quite well in print. But it's not really about division, print or screen. I think, together, it can create something more valuable. And what you see is that we do the print and digital edition. And that's, uh, uh, that has many advantages, you know. We, on our website, we tag all the content geographically, for example, or we tag all the authors. So you can really, you know, in digital media, you can find and you can navigate and you can uh, archive and you can index things in, very, in a very different way than, than you do it on print. In combination, you know, uh, print is really great I mean, if you want to read, read on a beach, if you want to read in Bath, you know, if you do many different things. But uh, digital things has clear advantages as well. You know, if you need to find something you write about and you need to search, you know, of course it's great to have something which you can uh, search and index. So I think the combination of it is really exciting. And then you can also extend and update articles, which we do as well. Uh, so there's a website. Uh, there's a, uh, there are ebook editions, uh, which can be read on you know, Kindles and iPads and wherever, all the, all the readers. So at the end, uh, it's not really, you know, it's, it's the content that matters. And it adopts the different readers, uh, different e-readers or different physical formats. To do this, uh, I realized that now, if you 
want to operate and, and across different media, you need to rethink the workflows. Um, and unfortunately, <coughs> most of the workflows in publishing today, uh, they are they're quite obsolete. You know? It's usually one department works for print, and another department works for, for screen-based media, and there's very little overlap or collaboration. <laughs> I always thought that you know, we want to make it as uh, tight as possible, as really as, uh, as uh, as productive as possible, as efficient, uh, and you know, when I look for tools that allow you know creating something from a single source and export it to print or, or digital media, I didn't really find existing tools. Um, they must exist, but they, maybe they're proprietary, maybe they're made for big publishers, but we didn't find it. So again, before making a magazine, we had to create our publishing platform, and uh, you know to do which allows us first collaboration between writers and editors and you know proofreaders, uh, so everything is happening, all the proofreading happens online. It does not happen, we don't proofread things in InDesign until you know, the last stage. Uh, we basically you know, archive all the, you know, all the changes and we keep track of, you know, same like when people were with code programmers, and you need to be very careful about you know, all the changes you made. We do the same with, with text, writing text. Uh, but secondly, more importantly, is that the, you know, we keep it in this stage uh, as long as possible, and only when it's you know, we extend the, the creative part until the very end, and the production part is really minimized. And then uh, at the end, it's exported, and we can export tag text into InDesign, which maps into style sheets, and it gives something uh, pretty close to what you want to have in print. And very quickly, you can you know, uh, create you know, HTMLs, or ebooks, or print editions. It was never intention to go to do this, but you know, it, it became a foundation in order to do the work they want to do. But uh, I'm mainly keen to talk about content because I think that's the uh, most exciting part. Um, and I'm standing here, but it's important to realize that it's not just me. The magazine is highly collaborative work. Uh, there are you know, journalists and, and writers and uh, photographers and researchers. And these, this, these are the people who work on, the, on this issue, the second issue of the magazine. Uh, and that's beyond the staff of you know, the people who work with it you know, permanently. Uh, and I manage most of it. Um, so let me talk about a few things that what we're interested in, because uh, although the themes of the magazine are quite diverse, I think there is something that connects them. Uh, and I'll explain a few things. Um, this is from the first issue of the magazine. It's a story about Dabawalas. Dabawalas are Indian. Uh, food uh, delivery network. Uh, they, they're, it's not catering, they don't cook, but what they do is that many Indian men, when they're professionals and when they go to work, they prefer to eat their homemade food. But because they will go to work at 6 in the morning or earlier, there's no way to take their homemade food uh, because it's not ready yet. So there's a service in Mumbai, in India, uh, that goes and picks up your homemade food at 10 or 11. And brings it to the office of the, of the husband or the son, and then goes back and delivers the empty uh, dish back home. And it sounds kind of obvious, but you know, imagine in a city of 60 million people, where many people want to do this. So you create a logistical nightmare uh, where you have hundreds of thousands of uh, dishes that need to be delivered across the city. Uh, and you know, it's not really simple to do it. There's, this service exists for 100 years, over 100 years. Uh, and became so fine-tuned and operating really in small uh, neighborhoods and areas. Each of the you know, uh, containers to, to deliver to people would be taken by up to 10 people. So it's really shifted uh, responsibility. And they achieve such efficiency that only one out of 10 million goes wrong. Uh, which is, again, something, if you do any million, uh, many operations, things go wrong. Uh, you know, they, they, they achieve to, without user, usage of technology, Without using you know any kind of software, uh, they managed to you know operate logist large logistics cooperation even though they're almost illiterate. In a magazine, we would send a writer and would you know look at this uh, how it's possible you know to, to operate something like this. You don't call this often design, but I think it's the operation of it, how you manage to operate something like this, is really interesting for designers because this is what we do. We tend to think that design is something. You know something on the surface visible, and if you forget that it happens, it's really the operation, how how it works. That that's what is design as well. A second example from this first issue uh, is this, which is a very local one. So 
I don't want to give the impression that it's always about the developing world. It's not. It's really about examples of, again, the unexpected creativity that happens anywhere. And that because, to, you know, if, it doesn't really matter if you call yourself designer or not. Uh, people use the creativity in their fields to make the world better. And uh, again, you, you can be carpenter or you can be manual worker, and you can be as creative as, you know, as an artist or a designer. Um, this is an example from Friesland, uh, from north of the country. Uh, and Hans Moldemann uh, was a pioneer of a concept called uh, shared space. Shared space basically is a response to urban traffic situation where you know, we have more and more cars and more pedestrians and bikes on the street. And uh, you know, until now, the common solution to this would be you know, separation for all, all elements uh, to, to guarantee the safety and then bringing out the traffic signs so it kind of uh, coordinates you know, the flow. Uh, what you would do is basically. Uh, would remove all uh, separations, re remove all the traffic signs, remove everything, and realize that. The traffic situation improves, the road safety improves by eliminating uh, any, any traffic signs. Uh, it sounds very counterintuitive. You think that uh, it in fact becomes more dangerous, but in reality, it's, you know, if you give the responsibility to people who are on the street, they, be they behave a lot more responsible, uh, they become a lot more responsible. Uh, again, it's very hard to think, you know, we tend to think that design is something very visual, but realize that. By eliminating something, by removing something, it can be a creative act, it can be a design act. By deciding not to design something, by deciding not to do something. So it's a quite a good example of uh, you know, what design can do by uh, reconsidering your position. Or another one from the first issue, which is, uh, um, this is a story about um, visual translator guys um, used by the US Army in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, all these young soldiers, when they go to Afghanistan, of course they don't speak the local language. And they're put in very stressful situations. Uh, and they need to communicate with locals. Uh, how do you do that you know, when you know, they don't have any experience? Uh, there's a company in, in uh, Virginia which developed these guys uh, for the US Army. And uh, uh, they look like you know, kind of funny cartoons, but uh, they're very serious ones. And so, uh, this is, uh, you, know, you have to know that you have to read from right to left, so you don't get paid for shooting helicopters, but uh, <laughs> you can get rewards uh, if you spot a down helicopter. Uh, and it just provides, in these cartoon strips, you know, like a vital information what to do and how to behave. And these soldiers have these laminated sheets, and uh, uh, the article in the magazine looks at the design process of something like this. Again, uh, it's not visually stunning, but it's really a story about collaboration of linguists and anthropo anthropologists uh, speaking to soldiers, speaking to like all involved, that leads to something like this, uh, which again is, you know, piece of the <coughs> And the final thing from the first issue is this, which again is a local one, and about half of the audience will recognize it. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, well, you know, you know, men are very simple, and, you know, they see some target, they usually go for it. Uh, and this is a piece of kind of behavioral design, that uh, uh, without using any instructions or manuals, you know, like, uh, uh, an image, uh, in this case, an image of a fly on a urinal, uh, can cause exactly you know, like a unpredictable behavior of a man. It's something uh, it's been tried out at Schiphol Airport, and at Schiphol, they, you know, they, they use these images of flies since the 80s. And apparently it saves the cleaning cost because uh, you, know, you, you focus on the target uh, and eliminates the splashing. And, uh, 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 it's quite remarkable. So it's a bit of an urban legend. I mean, people have known about this, but it would be a you know, good excuse to you know, uh, really make a research about how efficient uh, such a little thing is. It looks like you know, it's nothing, but at the end it makes a huge impact you know, across the years of using it. Uh, it basically saves all the money at, at, at public spaces. Uh, and again, you would not consider this to be kind of like a thing that you put in your portfolios. But it's such, it's such a clever you know, thing that uh, multiplied over and over can change you know, how airport functions. I'll talk a bit about the second issue. The first issue is always you know, a pilot, it's always fun to do. But I think the magazine is only made when you can follow up and then you can create continuity. Uh, and you, know, you need two or three to make a magazine. So now it's a magazine. And then the second issue, uh, 
we put more things together, which are basically symbolized by this image. Uh, there's a lot about transportation. There's a lot about you know the troubles that are caused by you know people living very close to the airport. Uh, a lot about you know bridging America, Asia, uh, Africa, and Europe. Um, and what I try to do personally is that you know because I work with many authors to combine the articles that it creates you know one narrative across the whole uh, across the whole magazine. It kind of there's a flow. So the flow starts at Schiphol again, uh, at Schiphol Airport, uh, and looks at this. Uh, you know that you know Schiphol is one of the busiest airports in Europe, certainly in Europe, <coughs> and the area of Schiphol is also one of the busiest uh, inhabited areas. So we have a lot of villages around, and it, of course you have a problem of you know there's too much noise and too many planes and too many people living around. What do you do with this? Uh, you can regulate the tra regulate the traffic. <laughs> But the recent solution, which has been implemented this year, is to to build this uh, strange art land, uh, land art uh, around Schiphol. Uh, so Paul de Court is an artist uh, that proposed in this land art piece, which basically uh, removes a bit of the noise pollution uh, from planes which are taking off. Uh, and you don't only think of art as being very functional, but this is a really highly functional piece of art that solves some of the problems and that. Uh, the aim is to reduce the, you know, the noise by I don't know how many decibels. We can, so there's an article that uh, talks about uh, kind of the more unexpected uh, solutions to, to, to facing this, this problem. The most common plane uh, landing in the Schiphol is this. It's a Boeing 747. So you know, we have like a, these kind of sub small links between the articles. Um, it's a story about development of this, art, of this plane. Um, when Boeing developed this, uh, this plane in the 60s, uh, they didn't really believe that this would be the future. They, they thought the future of airplane uh, uh, transportation would be supersonic planes. So this was a you know, low grade, low importance project. Uh, it was meant to be a cargo plane. Um, and um, it turns out to be you know, the most successful plane ever built. Uh, they are uh, you know, 10 times more built than, than predicted. Uh, it became the most successful passenger plane. And now, almost 50 years later, it's still flying around. Uh, and it just shows that, again, the unexpected results of when you do something for short term, it turns out to be more successful than you know, long term planning. Uh, and again, the possibility to discuss this. Uh, this plane, uh, Boeing 747, was made around the proportion of shipping container. Uh, so it's really, you know, it's a cargo plane, so it's, you, know, you can fit these containers uh, uh, in the width of the plane. And the next article that follows this story is an article about development of shipping, uh, of containers. And basically, uh, this, if you follow the development of containers, which again by itself is not a very attractive object, it's really a you know, steel box. Uh, but that single thing, that single object, changed really how the world operates. You know, since it was, since it had been standardized in the fifties, uh, it really, you know, it removed jobs, it created new jobs. It allowed us to wear different things because you can wear things made in different continents. It's basically, it's, uh, by following the evolution of containers, you can follow you know, the evolution of globalization. Uh, and again, it's a fascinating article written by economists, uh, which is strangely disunrelevant, you know, that they realize the importance of things in the world. And to balance it, again, another thing that follows is, uh, is how uh, globalization works in countries which are not so highly developed. Uh, there's a story of this building. Uh, this is a building that Chankin mentions in Hong Kong. It's one of the cheapest hostels uh, in Hong Kong. I think a lot of uh, backpackers, when they come to Hong Kong, they stay there because you can stay there for $8 uh, a night, uh, which attracts people from different, different parts of the world. If you look, uh, you know, there are hundreds of different nationalities, and strangely enough, you find a lot of Africans uh, who come from Africa uh, on their tourist visa, uh, and they bring stuff from China back to Africa. And they do it in such a massive scale that, for example, with mobile phones, uh, up to 20 million phones are brought from this particular building to Africa uh, in suitcases of people. And those containers uh, really have to just an informal trade of basically smuggling. Um, and you know, some countries, you know, like in Kenya, I think 80 percent of phones in Kenya would come really from this particular building. Uh, we had a person, an anthropologist, who lived in this building, who made the research and wrote a book about the building. His name is uh, Gordon Matthews, uh, 
and it would you know follow the trade, look at you know different schemes which are used, different models, uh, how people you know, do the business, coming with empty suitcases, packing them with something, bringing them back to Africa, and doing it on a weekly basis. Uh, this is uh, Gordon Matthews. Uh, if you've never seen Chunking Mansions in Hong Kong, you should go, because you'll be amazed. If you've never seen Chunking Mansions in Hong Kong, you should go, because you'll be amazed. It consists of probably the most globalized number of people in the world. I've counted 130 different nationalities there. And its major function is for what I call low-end globalization. Uh, people buy African traders, Indian traders, Pakistani traders buy mobile phones, clothing, furniture, all kinds of things in this building and take it back to their home countries via container or often in their own luggage. I estimate that 15 to 20 percent of the mobile phones now used in sub-Saharan Africa have come through this one building. People always think about globalization in terms of big corporations with their billions of dollars and batteries of lawyers. But that's not the way most of the world experiences globalization. Most of the world experiences globalization in terms of you know, individual traders coming back with a few hundred mobile phones or you know, items of clothing wrapped up in their luggage or in their battered containers and so on. That's what globalization is for 80% of the world's people. So you don't need an elaborate theory for that. That's what globalization is. And most people in the developed world don't know it. He's very enthusiastic person. <laughs> And we're lucky to speak to him and to write this article that shows, you know, like a, that within this micro, this one building, uh, you can basically see like how the world operates in a small, in a small building. Um, which brings us again to another article which has to do with smuggling. Uh, this is an example. Uh, this video is an introduction of Bocuse d'Or. Bocuse d'Or is a culinary show, uh, which is a major one. It's uh, you know, some people who are in the business of restaurant business. This is like the Olympic Games for, for chefs. This is like the World Cup, you know, it's an insane statue. But, uh, uh, to be able to qualify for this, you need to go to national rounds, you need to win, then you go to continental rounds. Uh, again, you need to be qualified. And then finally, you know, years later, you qualify for the final uh, round, which happens in France, in New York, uh, where there's a jury of 24 jurors, chefs, and you have four hours to, four and a half hour to cook uh, your meal to impress the chefs. Uh, there's a lot of money involved, there's a live audience of thousands of people, and you know, some people spend years in preparation. They've spent, again, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in preparation for this, because it can change their lives and careers. Uh, this has been documented by major media, uh, but all, they always talk about surface. They talk about you know, the appearance of food, how, it, how well it looks, they talk about how it, how it tastes. Uh, but I would be more interested in how it all works. You know, if you come, if you chef from Thailand or I don't know, Indonesia or Sri Lanka, and you come there, you know, to impress this jury, and you're always reliant, dependent on the local ingredients. So what do you do? You suddenly start cooking with French ingredients because it happens in France and you need fresh things. No, you know, they need to be quite creative. So they smuggle their, their food with them. They bring their live lobsters and crabs with them in suitcases. Uh, they bring pork bellies and you know, strange ingredients from different places, uh, which is not legal really you know, to, to travel with that. Uh, uh, but these you know, chefs, which are you know, the best known chefs in the world, you know, need to basically come up with you know, different schemes, how to pass the customs undetected, uh, have multiple you know, different suitcases you know, bringing the same thing uh, in order to, you know, to, to do something like this. Uh, so it's a nicely subversive story about chefs which need to do something not quite right in order to win something like this. Uh, so we conducted interviews with people talking about preparations, uh, and it links you know, all these different stories together. Um, so the article is called Smuggle Chefs, uh, and uh, uh, I think it's the first time that you can actually see the other operation. Of it. And I think that's what I would call design again, not just the visible output, but more the, you know, before something happens. Because this is uh, probably a lot more interesting. The, the magazine come, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, visual uh, essays as well. This one is about handmade balls made by kids in Africa. And many of them are made from condoms because you can get it for free you know, from all this, uh, <laughs> uh, all this help, you know, like humanitarian help. You know, and these kids are making footballs out of them, um, which is great. In the, in the press issue, we had the stories about what army chefs cook in military conflicts. You know, like, uh, 
it's not really something that we consider very often. But you know, the army chef is one of the you know, most important person in the army, uh, and you know, first thing to do is really clear things for the kitchen. Uh, so again, it would be a nice excuse to look at you know something that you don't really consider uh, very much. Um, I don't have so much time, so I'll go quickly. Uh, I'll talk briefly about distribution because uh, you, know, you can make really exciting content, but if it doesn't get to people, it's useless. Like, uh, it's uh, you know part of the you know, most fun we have really with making and you know researching and preparing and photographing stuff. But again, you, know, you can do it as much as you want, but you know, if it's not reaching the public, it's not creating, you know, playing around, uh, it's not going to work. I've done a magazine before. Uh, for 10 years, I've been working on a magazine called Dot Dot Dot. Um, and I learned you know, the hard way a few things. You know, when we did Dot Dot Dot, uh, to bring it to the US, uh, we would have to pay 82% of the cover price to the distri distributor. So you, know, you pay for all the you know, production and uh, you got all the content. And then you're left with 18% of the cover price, so, which is very little. Because again, the model is made that you know, it's not really the sales magazine that make uh, the funding. It's really the advertising. The sales contribute very little uh, to, to sales. So when uh, I started working on this magazine, where it's at work, it was clear that you know, something has to change uh, in order to make it a viable product, to make it sustainable. Uh, so I made this proposal. Works that work wants to examine often ignored areas of design. In the spirit of this aim, we also intend to bypass traditional distribution networks, which typically take the largest part of the cover price, as well as control where the publication will be sold and at what price. Instead, we would like to deepen our relationships with our readers and make them partners in this enterprise. We call this social distribution. Let's see how it works. A reader based, for example, in Buenos Aires knows a lovely bookstore in his town that could be a good place to sell a magazine. He first contacts the bookstore, and if they're interested, he then contacts us. The next time he or one of his friends travels to one of our magazine hubs, he buys copies of the magazine at a 50% discount. He in turn sells the magazines to the bookstore for 60 to 75 percent of the cover price. So the reader's profit is 10 to 25 percent of the cover price. He sends information about the store to us and we publish it on our website, driving other potential readers to the store. This distribution process supports local bookstores, involves readers as partners and agents of the magazine, ensures that all the parties get paid, and frees us up to focus on what we do best. Publishing the magazine. It has been a proposal, uh, and it, you know, when you make it, you don't really know how it's going to, what's going to happen. Uh, luckily, it has worked fairly well. You know, we have we, we put this list of shops online where people you know, can they brought it and they can find it again. But uh, one thing happened which I haven't really thought. You know, if the idea was to to bridge, you know, the, to bring the closest connection between publisher and the reader, you almost don't need the bookstore. You know, it's really in, in between. It's really like you know, we can we all cutting all the in between parts. Um, so you know, this has been. You know, I we, I was traveling in Brazil and we had uh, this discussions like, you know, maybe you know, we can just sell it ourselves. You know, we can go with friends. You don't really need the bookstores. And this happened. This happened spontaneously, proposed by the readers. And instead of again. Finding a bookstore to kind of profit from it, which is great, which I'm very happy to support bookstores. People would just use the distributor discount to make it as cheap as possible for themselves. And often in places where you know uh, it would be slightly costly, like you know, in South America, in India, uh, people would enjoy getting like, a better price for the magazine by you know cutting or distribute completely out of it or bookstore out of it. Uh, so we, you know, in the last you know, we, we sell most of magazines really this way. That uh, it's really informal sales of people who would buy books of magazines and you know distribute basically amongst a group of people, <coughs> organizing kind of informal reading uh, events uh, where sometimes uh, we would join with different authors uh, via Skype to talk about the magazine. But you know, creating kind of informal you know, network around the magazine again, uh, it is vital to have a way to reach the readers. And this became a way how to do it. Uh, 
It's quite a lot of space. I mean, we print 3,000 copies, so it's not a massive scale, and that's why it's still manageable. That's why I was surprised that you know, I've been picked up by you know, major media. This has been, Neiman Journalism Lab is a, a, is a kind of think tank at Harvard University, uh, which has been kind of, uh, they covered uh, the magazines, but mainly are distribution methods uh, in talking about future magazines. And it's been kind of very flattering to see it. Uh, you know, the Columbia Journalism Review they will do the same, talking about you know the, the distribution method of the magazine. Uh, after that, you know, the Fox Current would uh, write about you know the distribution magazine, which is I mean great. But it's, at the same time, I think like it's it's not about the distribution; it's about the content. <laughs> <laughs> you wish that the you know, attention would shift to it, but uh, it seems that this is the, the common trouble of publishers: that the you know, where you know the missing link or the, the failing part. Well, why why many? I mean, I could talk about why magazines are having a hard time, but I don't think we'll have uh, time for this. Uh, finally, um, events like this uh, really serve you know, as kind of blurring the differences and blurring the boundaries between uh, the readers and, and contributors because uh, uh, they become, I mean, the magazine improves the longer it goes because the more people know about it and, and you know, people see that. Uh, they propose the content for it as well. So what people did is that you know they, they first they spreading the word, so becoming you know, something, becomes a real magazine. But also you know like in, in the next issue we'll have like a number of articles from people I've never met from you know basically our readers who are so smart and they come up with content which you know uh, is really fitting, relevant, uh, and can be really easily presented in the magazine. Uh, it also help, you know, to, because uh, the readers are big, basically the partners of the magazine, it really helps the distribution as well. So the whole thing gets better, you know, when you know, the small world is uh, down. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.